and are busy making peace. Uh, my Lords, it is a privilege to follow the Most Reverend Primate, the Archbishop of York. Uh, I want to pay tribute to him for his public statement last Monday, and in particular for his message of support for the Jewish community here in the United Kingdom. Because although this excellent debate has ranged far and wide, I want to focus my remarks on matters rather closer to home. On Saturday night, I had two children in uniform. My son, who has now made his life in Israel, wore the uniform of the Israel Defence Forces. Like most 20-year-olds in Israel, he's doing military service. He personally saw the aftermath of Hamas's atrocities, sites which no 20-year-old, in fact no one, should see. But he's in uniform because if he and his friends were not in uniform, there wouldn't be an Israel. It really is that simple. My other child in uniform was my daughter. Her uniform was trainers, jeans, and a necklace with a Magen David, a Star of David, around her neck. That's her customary Saturday night uniform, in common with many teenage girls in North London as they come into town on the tube to enjoy this great city's nightlife. And I was more concerned about the safety of my daughter than of my son. So how on earth have we got to that place, where I'm more concerned about a teenage girl with the Star of David around her neck than my son in an army uniform in a country at war? There were three reasons. Information, institutions, and constitution. Let me give an example of each. First, information. The BBC is not a state broadcaster, but it is a national broadcaster. And I say this with genuine regret as a supporter of the BBC. In the last few weeks, it has brought us national shame. I need not take time with the BBC's abject failure to describe Hamas for what it is, in plain English, a terrorist group. After an intervention for me and other noble lords, the BBC announced that it stopped calling Hamas militants because, I'm not making this up, we have been finding this a less accurate description for our, for our audiences as the situation evolves. A less accurate description. No further comment is necessary. But last week, the BBC reported uncritically, and citing only Palestinian officials, which of course means Hamas, that Israel had struck the Al Ahly hospital. Now, that has now been corroborated from, by investigations around the world. What the Israelis said at the time has been corroborated that it was an Islamic Jihad rocket that hit the hospital. But that defamatory report is still on the BBC website. Now, we're used to some people in our community, such as Mr Corbyn, parroting Hamas propaganda. But to have the BBC do it, when it wouldn't have done so with propaganda from ISIS or Al-Qaeda, led to real consequences, not just the cancellation of a summit in Amman, but in this city too. Jewish schools closed, kosher restaurants smashed up, heightened security at every synagogue, and my daughter wondering whether it was safe to go on the tube. Others repeated that propaganda including, I'm afraid, a noble friend of mine, who tweeted not just that the Israelis had hit the hospital, but they had targeted it. She used that word twice. I called that out as a modern blood libel, and I'm delighted to see that the most reverend primate, the Archbishop of Canterbury, used the same language recently as well. But the damage was done. Other terrorist groups will have seen and taken note. So we should remember the old injunction, careless talk, costs lives. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Second, institutions. The Jewish community has learned over the past few weeks who our many friends are, but we've also seen who they are not. And let me just give one short example. Our universities. University Jewish societies no longer publicise where they are meeting. The address is handed out Samizdat fashion shortly before the meeting. This isn't some underground group in Soviet Russia. It is a Jewish society in this country in 2023. Our universities have become centres of binary thinking. 
where you are either an oppressor or an oppressed. And it would seem in the case of Israel, oppressors include murdered babies and kidnapped grandmothers, although sometimes Hamas preferred to kidnap the babies and murder their grandmothers. Students and their professors will write long and apparently scholarly articles explaining how words are violence and silence is violence, but now offer no words and only silence in the face of not just violence, but a pogrom. So if when we face terrorism, careless talk costs lives, silence in the face of terrorism costs even more. Third, our constitution. I do not mean the royal and political elements of our constitution, the moral lead shown by His Majesty the King in response to what went on, and his granting the Chief Rabbi a private audience has resonated across the entire Jewish community. So also has the principled stance taken by the Prime Minister and also the leader of the opposition and other political leaders as well. This is not a party political issue. The Jewish community is protected by law, but at the moment, many feel that they are not protected by those whose job it is to enforce the law. Absolutely. The shout from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is not a nursery rhyme. <laughs> it is a murderous rhyme because it calls for the destruction of Israel and necessarily it in, its inhabitants. It's not a demand for the two-state solution in which I and so many others still believe. But the police have done nothing about it. They didn't intervene even when members of Hizbut Tahrir, a group which is illegal in many other Western countries, but for some reasons is still legal here, chanted for jihad. And I'm aware that jihad has several meanings, it, apart from armed struggle. It can refer to self-reflection, personal improvement, and quiet meditation. But when it's chanted on the streets of London with a banner referring to Muslim armies liberating Palestine, and when their website refers to, quote, heroic feats carried out by the heroic Mujahideen in the blessed land Palestine, I simply do not understand how the Metropolitan Police concluded that that cry for jihad was not supporting or glorifying Hamas, which is a criminal offence. <laughs> Careless talk costs lives. Silence in the face of terrorism costs more, and police inaction will only encourage those who want to bring their violence and their terrorism here. We need to change, to call out terrorism for what it is, to speak out against terrorists and their apologists here, to act firmly to keep people, everyone, safe. The safety of my son in his army uniform is ultimately a matter for the Government of Israel. But the safety of my daughter on the tube in London is a matter for our government and for this parliament. My Lord, may I conclude with this? The noble and right reverend uh, Lord Harris of Pentregarth quoted Jeremiah 31.15 in his speech. The prophet there sees the matriarch Rachel in her resting place at Ramah, so close to Bethlehem, weeping as the people of Israel are led past her as captives into exile. She's weeping and she refuses to be comforted. And as the noble Lord said, that verse is repeated in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 2, verse 18. There is a Jewish tradition. We do not end a biblical reading on a note of despondency. So let me conclude by reciting the immediately following two verses in Jeremiah as we all pray for the safe return of all the hostages. Thus saith the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. For there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, v'shavu vanim ligvulam, thy children shall return to their own borders. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah.